Well, I think linkages to the community is sort of first step is to really determine what the need is or the needs are and, and define those. Business of Architecture, episode 240. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the podcast for architects and designers where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. Uh, by impactful, we might even say meaningful, and that is what we're going to be focused on today. Now, if you haven't already, get free instant access to the four-part Architecture Firm Profit Map video by going to freearchitectgift.com. In that video, I've basically outlined all the insights that I've gotten from doing over five years of interviews with some of the world's leading and successful architects. So you'll find all of that information in that free video. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core, the all-in-one solution for managing your architecture firm. From project management to accounting, time and expenses, billing, and business intelligence, Core does it all. Get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. Have you ever wanted to work for clients with a mission that you are passionate about? Earlier in the intro, I talked about working for meaningful work, doing work that you feel is meaningful. Well, today we speak with Roger Tucker, the Executive Director of Environmental Works. Environmental Works is a community design center based in Seattle, Washington. It's a nonprofit. In this episode, we discuss what it takes to run a community design center, including the finances and the kind of work this firm does. Roger, welcome to the Business of Architecture. Thank you. Thanks for, for having me and having us, the office representative. It is our pleasure. And start out by telling us what is Environmental Works Community Design Center? So Environmental Works is a nonprofit community design center. Uh, it was started in 1970 as, as an outgrowth, actually, of a class at the University of Washington. So it was started really by professors and students. And it was to to address issues around design and income disparity, and uh, really at that time urban urban decay. So um, the mission is really to serve underserved communities and do it through design, and particularly through participatory design, so in engaging users in the design process. And then also, as the name implies, Environmental Works has always focused on energy efficiency and doing things with sort of a light touch on the earth, started, uh, actually was founded on the very first Earth Day in 1970, which is a statement about our values, and um, before sustainability was even really a term, it was, it was part of the culture. Tell me about the, the business model of environmental works. How does, where do the funds come from? How does that work? So we are 501c3. Uh, we are a nonprofit mission-based. And, but in, in many ways, we act much like an architectural organization where um, much of our work is fee for service, but it's all publicly funded work. It's all, all of our work is for nonprofit organizations. And they, in turn, receive their money from public sources or private capital campaigns. Um, so we're, it's, it's publicly funded. A good portion of the work is fee for service. Another portion is through grants. For many years, we had uh, grant money from City of Seattle to provide free services, free feasibility services for social service agencies. And then in addition, we seek donations for kind of specific projects. And in terms of the operating budget of the organization, how much would you say comes in from donations and how much comes in from the fee for service versus, and then I guess the third category you mentioned was the grant. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's shifted over the years and partly due to a lot of available funding for affordable housing, especially, I'd say 90, 95% of our work is fee for service, publicly funded uh, projects and the remainder being grants and or donations. And we're really working, so as I mentioned, we had a, a good source of grant money from the city of Seattle for feasibility work. The money went away in a recession. Uh, it was block grant and then became community uh, just general funds through the city and then eventually was uh, cut out because of, of 
just the, the, the Great Recession. But we've been working both with the city to resuscitate that fund, but also sit with our board to do more fundraising about around recreating some of those moments so we can continue to provide that service. Another wonderful thing about being a nonprofit um, is that if we do have a surplus at the end of the year, in a for-profit, you, you're pretty much forced to give that out to your shareholders or uh, staff or whatever, so you don't pay taxes on it. But we're able to keep a good portion of it to be able to provide more free services to the nonprofits we work with. Okay. Now, you mentioned that all the work you do is publicly funded work. When you are acquiring those commissions, how does that process work? Is it, are you bidding against other firms? Are you pre-selected? Tell me a little bit about the actual selection process for how an entity uh, might choose to work with environmental works. Right. Well, the good portion of our work, 80 to 85% of it is with repeat clients. So, organizations, nonprofits that we have worked with in the past on similar projects. Um, we do some uh, responses to requests for qualifications, so are competing with other, other firms on pro- a certain number of projects every year. Um, there are, primarily those are affordable housing projects that uh, are just for various funding reasons are advertised. And generally the feedback we have on that because uh, I've gotten on that is our our fees are generally within market range. We're not undercutting anybody. We're not uh, we're, you know, we're, 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 we want to provide living wages for the staff that work here so we're, we're providing you know, services at pretty much the market rate. Okay so and you said the majority of your clients are repeat clients is that right? That, that is correct. We, we have uh, really built a wonderful network of organizations that we work with, if you look at our roster of projects and the clients where the nonprofits we're working with, some of the names go back to the 1970s. So it's just ongoing working knowledge. Well, I, I know some firms out there are uh, nonprofit in terms of their books, right. but not in terms of their legality. So. Right. You know, at least you get the benefit of having the tax code on your side in terms of how you disperse those funds. Right, right. And, and, can, it, uh, and it is because we're mission-based and we really are just working on projects that serve the greater good in underserved communities. Yeah. So, Roger, tell me about your personal story about getting involved in environmental works. Boy, it's a long story. You know, it's always been an, uh, I think, an interest of mine to do architecture that that serves um, serves not the usual clientele. So I came to Seattle originally from the East Coast in 1977 as a Vista volunteer. So Vista is Volunteers in Service to America, sort of a um, domestic peace corps. And at the time, I was working for an organization that was about two blocks away from Environmental Works. And it was a nonprofit, and it served uh, minority communities primarily in the Central District of Seattle. And um, they introduced me, actually, to people at Environmental Works because it was close by, and they had a working relationship. And so that was my first sort of knowledge that such an organization was around. And, I, you know, definitely something I wanted to pursue. And... Um, but it wasn't until 1997 that uh, I joined the organization and I joined with a number of other folks from another firm. It was doing similar sorts of work, um, socially oriented, um, nonprofit work, but uh, we were able to join up and actually become a nonprofit. Okay, so, and what year was that that you joined Environmental Works? 1997. Okay, 1997. And it looks like you're, it looks like you came as the director of architecture at that time and you were working with another firm before that. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, I guess maybe a little bit more about the like, trajectory when, um, when I was an undergraduate school, I had the opportunity to do a semester abroad in 
um, in London at the Architectural Association. And the professor or the leader of that studio was a, an avowed socialist. And we worked on projects that were alternative um, models for urban redevelopment. So it's sort of, I think the first introduction to, hey, you know, architecture has some other values and you can pursue other things than just doing beautiful single family houses. So um, it's really what piqued my interest, I guess. And then after I was here as a VISTA, I went back to New York to go to school at, at Columbia and, and then found a position with a firm that was doing development work as well as architecture for um, low income home ownership programs, primarily in Coney Island at the time. So sort of continued that interest and in, in knowledge base and then was able to come back to Seattle in 86 and work for a woman, Jan Gleason, who eventually became the executive director here when I was director of architecture, whose um, self-description was a, a social worker in three dimensions. So the focus of her work was also in that same realm of underserved communities. I don't think Aren't I you going back? No, I think I diverged. <laughs> I think I think I got I got the answer I was looking for. You gave me a little bit more of the history, though. That's fine. I want to just go back to the finances a little bit of the organization. Mm-hmm. How, how? Tell me about if it is much of a struggle to run a nonprofit from a financial standpoint. I, I know a lot of nonprofits that is a constant concern of there's finding funding. It sounds like you guys are unique because you're actually doing for fee work. So you're offering professional services, which is obviously tangible value to your clients. Can you give me a feel for, you know, as, as the director, is this something that's you're kind of stressing out all the time about where the next money's going to come in? Or do you feel like the, the, you know, the company has firm financial legs and there's no worries there. Give me a feel for that. I'm just curious how that works. No, fair question. And it's, um, I'd say it's, it's market related, but as a nonprofit funding for the types of projects we do isn't, um, isn't as tied to the, uh, directly tied to the economy. So we're kind of a bit behind the cycle. So for example, in the, in the beginning of the recession in 2008, we were actually busier than we had been because of incentive monies that was available to to you know, create projects and really get get these um, really needy, affordable uh, work going. And then it wasn't until after the tax base sort of had fallen out and dropped that the, that kind of public funding started to go away. And for us in 2010 and 2011, it was really a crunch when other firms were starting to pick back up again. But um, it is, it's, it's difficult. I mean, the, the projects that we work on like, don't have huge budgets. There, there, uh, you know, there's a certain amount of efficiency built in there, but at the same time, we are really service oriented, and um, particularly with community design process, it, it can take a little bit more effort and take a little more time. But we really are invested in it, and uh, you know, make it work. What are the main KPIs that you're looking at when you're managing the organization to make sure that it's on the right track? financially and just in terms of not having too much scope creep, but making everything work kind of what are the numbers that are your, that you're keeping top of mind? Well, we do a fairly, um, because we have a board of directors and we have monthly meetings, we do financial projections on a monthly basis, certainly uh, scoping out what, what work we have coming up and, and what we expect the cost to be. Um, and we also, we, we do it on a weekly basis as well. So, uh, we're just tracking, tracking workload like many firms do and then you know, projecting, uh, revenues and costs. So I'm not sure there's a, there's a big difference in that sort of modeling. Is this a model uh, since you've been involved this far, is this a model do you think that someone else in another location or city could replicate? Would this work someplace else, what you guys are doing up there in Seattle? Oh, absolutely. And, and there are many other examples of community design centers. We're members of the Association for Community Design Centers, which is a national organization. And um, there, I believe there are about 40 or 50 um, 
community design centers or related practices around the country. Uh, some models that have been around almost as, I think it's about the same length of time. There's one in uh, Berkeley, the Asia Neighborhood, Neighborhood Design Center. There's one in LA, um, Craft Center in New York has, has been around, I think, an equal amount of time. Many of them of the community design centers are still university based, so don't provide full services the way we're able to do. But, um, some of some of the other private nonprofits like the Asian Neighborhood Design Center do essentially what we do. I have a friend who was very passionate about starting a community design center here in Fresno. It never really took off. It never really got legs. Unfortunately, I was very captivated by the idea as well. Uh -huh. If What would you say to someone who is an architect, they want to give back, maybe there's not already a community design center in their location. Do you have any tips for someone about how to get started with this and really grow a viable community design center? Well, I think linkages to the community is sort of first step is to really determine what the need is or the needs are and, and define those. And then you can approach various groups about how those, those uh, different needs can get funded or supported. There's some, uh, some of the design centers rely heavily on AIA as a, as a source of, of revenue to support other organizations. Um, some provide, are funded by universities, some are private foundations. So there's, it sort of depends on the context and the, and the need, um, I would say. But it, there are various uh, nonprofits, community design centers starting up, right? You know, here, there's an annual conference with the Association of Community Design Centers and you're pretty much, uh, every year about a new organization that might be taking root. I so what I'm hearing is like many organizations, there's a lot of volunteer time to start with and sort of, you know, you probably expect you're not going to make uh, ends meet until probably a couple of years in. So. So, what I'm hearing you say is get involved in the association, try to probably meet people like yourself that are running community design centers, uh, reach out to the community, find out what the needs are, and see if you can find other organizations that want to take part in this from a client standpoint. Right, right. And going back maybe to Environmental Works start, um, the first year was pretty much volunteer uh, student effort. Um, I think many of the, the founders were at the university still. Um, their first employee was paid for by uh, City of Seattle funding. So they were able to uh, lobby, the, lobby the city council and, and so show really what the need was and how they were uh, serving the needs of central Seattle at that time primarily. Um, and from there, the relationship with the community grew and the, and the city's recognition that there were some really benefit to providing services that environmental groups were serving. So the, the funding continued to grow from there. Um, and then the organization itself is built in capacity and services and, and, and was able to branch out in, in sources of revenue as well. What kind of projects are you working on at the moment? Roger? Oh, we've got a great mix of projects. And uh, I think the one I'm most excited about right now, now is uh, a project with the Ethiopian community in South Seattle. It's, uh, it's a brand new community center on a site that they purchased a number of years ago. And they have an operating community center, but it's an older building that's kind of falling apart. But, uh, big development potential for a much bigger site. So new uh, community center and then uh, low income senior housing above that. So about a hundred units of housing and then a 22,000 square foot center with the, really the heart of the Ethiopian community with the uh, heart of that being a kind of coffee shop meeting space, a large banquet hall for 500 to 600 people because um, they have a lot of uh, just wonderful group get togethers and uh, both weekly and larger festivities on an annual basis. Uh, a big plaza, community plaza, was a large part of their programming exercise. We, we did a whole series of community design workshops around 
uh, project to understand the program better, to understand the culture better, and really have the members of the community put together the, this kit of parts that we gave them and organize the spaces how they want to organize and give us a vision visually of how the center was going to look that, that meant something to them. So what uh, I'm hearing from you is that uh, participatory design, is that what you would call it, is very much a part yeah. of the process? Yes, very much a part of the process. Not on all of our projects, but it's, it's more and more of a focus of our work. Um, and it's, I think, makes the most indelible, you know, sort of lasting projects. And so that was just one example of some of the projects we're working on. We have a variety of... Can I, can I, can I pause you right sure. there with that one? That sure. sounds like an interesting project. What goes into bringing about a project like that? It does sound a little bit complex. It has housing above. It has a community center below. I would imagine there's some management entity involved. How do all these... Can you give me an overview of how a project like that actually comes together and happens? Oh, actually gets implemented and put together? Yeah, well, just the deal, right? So you have the... Uh, the old community center they've been using, you have the Ethiopian community, uh, maybe they have land or they want to tear down their existing building, build a new one. How do they bring in funding, money, stakeholders, and just kind of make that thing happen? A uh, variety of different approaches. They've been really active um, uh, politically, both locally and at the state level. So uh, tremendous amount of support from the city for providing us a place for this community. Uh, so they were able, um, and they, have a lot of good contacts at the state level. So had the legislature has allocated what's called the Building Communities Fund for a good portion of the project. Uh, we have the Office of Housing, which is uh, City of Seattle uh, funding for the housing, good portion of the housing part of it. At the uh, present time, the city also has uh, an initiative to, to be able to fund more child care and the child care component is part of this community center. So it's, it's really a mix of funding sources and connections. We had a, a recent meeting with the Ethiopian community and then four different departments from the city of Seattle that each had a source of funding for a different component from the project. Uh, typically on all of our projects, there's a development consultant that helps put all these funding sources together manage the, the allocation of the funds and, and uh, also oversight throughout the, the whole project management of the project. And is this something that the client gets you guys involved early on in the project? How, where along the line do you typically come into something like this? It's typically early on. And in this case, we were, we really were really excited to be on the, uh, in part of the team at the very start. So, help shape the vision of it, help shape the program and uh, make sure the community is really involved. Roger, what other projects are you doing then in addition to this community center? We have a, a pretty wide range of projects we're working on, um, all the way from smaller single family remodels to group homes for um, develop, uh, people with developmental disabilities. So in other words, we're converting a single family house into a, uh, a group home for people with development and physical develop disabilities, pretty severe in many cases. And those are all over the state. We have been working with an organization on eight to 10 of those a year on a smaller range. We we do a, a good range of community of child care centers, uh, both large and small, two or three classrooms up to new buildings for, um, I think our largest one right now is for six, six classrooms, and as I mentioned, the Ethiopian Community Center will have a child care unit. And sort of mid-range, we're doing a number of uh, renovations of existing affordable housing stock. There's uh, a lot of work that was done in the 60s and 70s. The buildings are starting to age, and so we're working with uh, nonprofit clients to make them more energy efficient, make the, give them another 50 years of life, and uh, make sure that they're still working for the residents that live there. And then we have many uh, uh, mixed use affordable housing projects and they, they range in size from 50 to 125 units. So the larger projects tend to be in the city of Seattle. And we're doing more and more work in Eastern Washington for farm worker uh, housing and both combination of seasonal farm worker uh, housing as well as permanent family 
housing. What is the part of your job that you get most excited about that you really enjoy? I think just working with people here in the office and also clients and that whole group process, participatory process, working together as teams. And that's, that's the most enjoyable part of any practice, I think. Awesome. And then how can people find out more about Environmental Works? Well, we have an awesome website, uh, www.eworks.org, and uh, you'll see a number of our projects uh, represented. Our process is represented, I think, pretty well in a new video that we did just last year, describes the community design process and, and its impacts, really, on the, the groups that we work with. Fantastic. Roger Tucker, thank you so much for joining us today here on Business of Architecture. Roger Tucker is the Executive Director of Environmental Works uh, in Seattle, Washington. Thank you so much for having me. Good talking. That is a wrap. As a podcast listener, get access to my free four-part architecture firm profit map by going to freearchitectgift.com. You can also get it by texting the phrase profit map, that's two words, to the phone number 773-770-4377. Today's podcast is sponsored by AIA Advantage partner BQE Software, the makers of BQE Core. BQE Core is office management software for architects. Peter Drucker famously said, what's measured improves. BQE Core lets you easily measure your key financial performance indicators, and it's dead simple. Get insights on the profitability of your firm with a beautiful and easy to customize graphical dashboard. Core gives you the power you need to grow your firm and keep your hard-earned profit. And they have pricing structures that work for the smallest of sole practitioners to the largest of firms. Learn more and get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.